Well, good morning, everyone, uh, and welcome, or good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you may be. Uh, I am Larry Diamond, a senior fellow at the Hoover Institution here, uh, and it's my pleasure uh, to uh, open this event and to introduce our uh, extraordinary speaker. Uh, this is a program entitled The Fractured Himalaya, How the Past Shadows the Present in India-China Relations. And that is the title of the forthcoming book to be released next month by Penguin Random House of our very distinguished speaker, Nirapama Rao. Uh, our event today is co-sponsored by the Hoover Institution's two projects on China's global sharp power and on strengthening US India-China India -China relations. I'd like to thank my colleague, uh, the program manager of the China Global Sharp Power Program, Glenn Tiffert, uh, my colleague, Dr. Dinsha Minstry, the program uh, manager of our project on US-India relations. And most of all, I'd like to thank uh, our esteemed friend and colleague, uh, longtime uh, former ambassador to India, uh, David Mulford. Uh, who's been a visionary leader for the Hoover Institution in putting uh, India on the map geopolitically in the United States and on the map of Hoover's very ambitious plans uh, to engage India in the years and decades going forward. Beyond having been India's ambassador to the People's Republic of China, Nirapama Rao is uniquely well qualified to speak to the topic today. She is one of India's most distinguished career diplomats. Now retired from India's foreign service, she held India's highest career position in foreign policy as foreign secretary in the government of India from 2009 to 2011. She was the second woman to hold that distinguished post. Subsequent to that, she was the ambassador of India to the United States from 2011 to 2013. Earlier, she served as the spokesperson of the Ministry of External Affairs and High Commissioner of India in Sri Lanka. Since her retirement, Secretary Rao has been a fellow at Brown University and a visiting professor there, and the George Ball adjunct professor at Columbia in fall 2018. In 2019, she was a Pacific Leadership Fellow at UC San Diego, and she's been a Global Fellow of the Woodrow Wilson International so Center for Scholars in Washington, DC. She's a member of the board of IIM Bangalore, of the, India, of the US India Business Council, and a number of other organizations. She holds a degree of Doctor of Letters Honoris Causa from Pondicherry University, and is the recipient of the Vanita Ratna Award of the Government of Kerala, which must, I think, be precious to her because that is the state of her birth. Uh, Secretary Rao, um, it's an extraordinary honor for us to have you here this morning. We look very much forward to reading the book version of your research and analysis, but we uh, invite you now to give us the uh, lecture version. Thank you. Thank you, Larry. And thank you, Ambassador Mulford, who is such a great and valued friend of us here in India. Uh, thank you, Dinsha. And it's a privilege to be at, on this platform at the Hoover Institution. So it's really an honor for me. Thank you so much for inviting me. Um, I, I thought I should start by uh, contextualizing uh, the story of the Fractured Himalaya, which is the title of my forthcoming book. India and China are two of the biggest countries in Asia, as you all know, and questions of peace and security and war and conflict between these two countries are important, not just for us in the region, but for the rest of the world. Uh, therefore, it makes sense for us to be talking about these issues today. Last year, as you all know, there was an incident in the Galwan Valley uh, in Ladakh, which is a very remote high altitude plateau uh, in the region of, uh, of what all of you are 
uh, well acquainted with the region of Kashmir, although now it, it's a separate union territory, Ladakh. And uh, if you look at the map, map it occupies a, a huge uh, chunk of the territory of the erstwhile state of Jammu and Kashmir, which is today a union territory of Jammu and Kashmir and a union territory of Ladakh. So what happened in the Galvan Valley in June last year was a clash between Indian and Chinese troops, which led to a loss of life, a considerable loss of life, 20 Indian army personnel, including uh, the commanding officer, a colonel, died in that clash and we, the, the People's Liberation Army also had a number of casualties, although we never will really know what the actual number of those killed on the Chinese side uh, was. But this incident was a turning point in India-China relations and it brought back a lot of the memories of what had happened in the past. You see, since 1975, not a single shot had been fired in the border areas between India and China. But before 1975, we, we had sporadic uh, clashes between the two sides. And in 1962, as you all know, there was a conflict, a full-fledged conflict between India and China. So the structure of relations that had been built up between the two countries since 1975, when we had, you know, tension had considerably eased and um, relations had improved, that modus vivendi came apart in Galvan last year. In fact, it had been, it had begun to show signs of stress uh, even before that. And you all know that we are confronted today with a much more assertive China, as, uh, as I've said before, a China not afraid to hide its brilliance. Uh, there's a much more muscular approach to issues concerning territorial sovereignty, particularly. And since India and China have an unresolved boundary question, it was very graphically illustrated in the increased activism of the Chinese in the areas along our long border, one of the longest land borders between uh, two countries, a border that is over 2000 miles long. So in a sense, our differences are now very full-fledged disputes uh, along the border that, that we share. And we live at a time when China is much more active in the region of South Asia. And you know, we were just talking about, uh, when we met this evening, we were talking about the situation in Afghanistan, uh, the, uh, the re-emergence of the Taliban and what that means for countries like India. And China, you know, has uh, is seems poised to take advantage of that situation. Although we really don't know what the outcomes will be, there's a great deal of uncertainty. But what is clear is that there are many imbalances in the region. There are questions of uh, how we are going to deal uh, with China, Iran, Russia, and Pakistan in uh, the region of Afghanistan and how a country like India, which is a near neighbor of Afghanistan, a great friend of the Afghan people, is going to be able to calibrate its reactions uh, to the emergent situation. As you all know, the China-Pakistan factor is a very, very looming issue uh, for, for the region. So my uh, India and China really coming to the subject of my book, share one of the oldest modern diplomatic relationships uh, between any two countries. And it, as I said, it's a relationship with a very turbulent past. It began on a cordial note in the 1950s when the two countries spoke about the five principles of peaceful coexistence between themselves but everything disintegrated when the border question was exposed, just as it has disintegrated uh, with Galvan last year. So there's a sense of deja vu about what we see unfolding today in the relationship between the two countries. So what happened in the 1950s was that the Chinese built a highway in, in the Ladakh region, in the in that part of Ladakh that we call Aksai Chin, which links Xinjiang with Tibet. And um, we also had simultaneous to that, the troubles in Tibet, 
which led to the flight of his holiness, the Dalai Lama, to India in the March of 1959. So the Dalai Lama has lived in India now for over 60 years. It's close uh, to uh, 63 years. In fact, it will be in March next year. Uh, so all these issues compounded difficulties in the India-China relationship, which culminated in the conflict of 1962. We tried um, from the mid 1980s onwards when the then Prime Minister Rajiv Gandhi took an extraordinary leap of faith to travel to Beijing to meet with the Chinese leadership and to take a long term perspective of this relationship. What he basically said was while the border question between our two countries is going to take time to solve, let's build mutual confidence a greater level of trust and uh, improve relations in other areas. But that, as I referred to at the beginning, is the structure of relations that has now virtually collapsed with what happened in Galvan. And, uh, and the road that lies ahead is certainly uh, fraught with a great deal of uncertainty. Will the two countries take into account the larger picture in their relationship with two of them, the largest nations in Asia, uh, how are they going to uh, craft a relationship at least that, that reduces tension, that addresses uh, the need uh, to solve these long-standing issues that have divided them for, for close for over seven decades now. Will that really happen? Uh, will, they, will we see that kind of vision applied to the relationship by the policy making establishments of both countries? That's the question. But today, in today's world, the, the image and the, and the um, reactions that we've seen associated with China, and as I said, the rise of a very muscular, assertive China, uh, do not exactly give much cause for us to be sanguine about how the future uh, will will and will unfold, and that is a situation that is going to impact the Indo-Pacific uh, as much as it will impact India-China relations. Diplomacy, in my view, is about finding middle ground, but I don't know whether we'll be able to find that middle ground. I hate to sound pessimistic. Most importantly, is China prepared to find that middle ground today? Because on the question of sovereignty, you've seen the way the Chinese have behaved in the South China Sea, in the way you know, other nations in Southeast Asia have reacted to, uh, to the way the Chinese approach uh, their border claims in the maritime environment of the South and East China Seas. You're dealing with a China that's very different from the China we dealt with in India in the early years of the People's Republic. At that time, they were consolidating their nationhood, finding their way in the world. But today, it's, it's a different situation. But, um, uh, you know, how do we take a long-term perspective of this relationship? So my, my book, uh, essentially, uh, uh, deals with this, uh, this very fraught uh, relationship. And as I've mentioned, it's, it's the intention is to talk about uh, what happened in the years between 1949 to 1962, a very formative and yet self-destructive phase in a troubled relationship. It began uh, with the visualization of one man's fascination with China, and that was Jawaharlal Nehru, our first prime minister, his romantic idealization of India and China working together as leaders for a new Asia, and uh, how that dream really came apart. Um, the uh, di diplomatic relations between India and China were established at, in, at the advent of their, of their becoming independent, or in the case of the Chinese, we talk about the so-called liberation and the establishment of the People's Republic. But um, I think there was nationalism and a determination to throw off the shackles of past foreign humiliations that informed the approach of both countries to questions that concerned their borders, their peripheries. And then uh, in, in the case of India and China, the area involved 
uh, in the area in question was Tibet, really, bordering India's Himalayan frontiers. And we were essentially unprepared for the advance of the People's Liberation Army into Tibet. India's ties with Tibet were old. Buddhism cemented this uh, closeness. The British had established a presence in Lhasa and southern Tibet from the early 20th century. And this is the situation that India inherited. And this is the situation that the Chinese were extremely suspicious about. But uh, independent India really, um, uh, in a sense, conceded much of China's position as far as Tibet was concerned. And I believe at the expense of its own uh, security, because while we did concede um, that Tibet was a part of China, uh, we were not, uh, we took decisions really, very conscious policy decisions, which in retrospect seem, uh, seem to have been completely maladjusted to the emergent realities. Uh, in uh, recognizing Tibet uh, when at the same time you had an unsettled frontier between India and China, a frontier that was very much tied to the understandings that the British had reached with the Tibetans uh, on uh, where that frontier lay and how, how it was delineated on, on the map. So I don't think uh, I should go into too long a spiel about all that happened uh, because I know the time left for our, for our discussion. Uh, I should leave enough time for discussion uh, and uh, for a conversation uh, with Larry and with Ambassador Mulford. But uh, I just wanted to say that uh, that we did not secure a common frontier between the two countries and as events proved and as the Chinese consolidated their position in Ladakh and built the highway across the Aksai chain, opinion, public opinion in India also hardened uh, once the news was out and the scope for negotiation uh, really was narrow, very, very, it became very constricted and much narrowed and in a sense prevented any, any, any mutual accommodation from being reached. And then the road to conflict was uh, virtually open after that. So there, there's much to be learned from the, uh, from the period of, I have written about in my book from 1949 to 1962, uh, the role of that Tibet played in this saga um, the, uh, the personalities of the leaders involved, uh, Mr. Nehru, Cho Lai, Mao Zedong, uh, the role of institutions like parliament, uh, legislat legislatures in a democracy, you know, have a great role to play, uh, especially when it comes to questions of sovereignty and when it comes to questions of uh, national security. And the role of the defense establishments also, uh, you know, how the Indian army reacted to the emergent situation, uh, how, decision, how the impression uh, was so strong on the Indian side that the Chinese would not attack when, it, uh, you know, they were virtually preparing all the time to consolidate their position in Tibet and to strengthen their position along the borders with India. And, to, uh, and ultimately it came down uh, to open conflict uh, between the two countries. This is, a, this is a story that talks also about the reactions and, and the attitudes of countries like the United States, uh, the erstwhile Soviet Union as the dispute unfolded. And, and most importantly, what lessons uh, were learned by uh, a, a, a very young Indian Republic uh, following, you know, those very tragic events uh, that uh, surrounded the conflict between the two countries. So that really is the is the um, the subject of my book, uh, and I invite all of you to read it once once it is out. Uh, but why I say the past uh, shadows the present in India-China uh, relations is because this whole. Um, area, the Himalayas, you know, the mountains that's, that separate Tibet and China from India, uh, they are, they affect the ecology of the region. It's not just 
um, questions of national security that are involved. Of course, they are very important, but you know, there is the livelihood of uh, mountain peoples, there are questions of climate, there are questions of water. Uh, you know, this whole issue, the razor's edge of inherited frontiers that divide us today, uh, somehow, you know, seem to eclipse uh, the importance of, of us understanding uh, what issues like, or issues that concern two and a half billion people, as it were, who inhabit South and Central Asia, issues in terms of climate, water, sustainability, preservation of intangible heritage, disaster management and prevention, human security. So contested sovereignties and cartographies have prevented the coordinated sustainable development of these areas and their opening to the world. So we've essentially been stuck with notions of center and periphery, mainland and margins, the discourse of sovereignty, the closure of borders, traditional points of interaction, and the movement of peoples. In fact, today, the map precedes everything. So the overarching compass of India-China relations therefore points to a very complicated future. And as the world wakes to the presence of a rejuvenated China that has put imperial decline and famine and revolution behind it and whose economy has grown phenomenally over the last two decades, um, you know, India and China really face a very competitive and armed coexistence between themselves, a very complex bilateral relationship. And nationalistic instincts and tendencies in both countries have meant that perceived wrongs and humiliations suffered in the past are magnified in the popular imagination. So in a sense, sometimes I always say this is a voyage, I feel on a river of no return. I hope a renewal of conflict is not uh, you know, a given. I hope it's not a matter of time. And uh, I really hope that uh, there are other options available. I mean, I think this affects the Indo-Pacific region in essence, because uh, the future of relations between India and China is too important for the rest of the world uh, to, to ignore. Uh, so I, I'd like to stop here uh, because I understand that there will be questions and there should be time for our conversation too. Thank you. That was as eloquent as I'm certain the book will be. Uh, and um, we thank you for it. Uh, David, would you like to begin? Well, I would begin by thanking Madam Secretary for what I would call a, an extremely elegant, but also highly informative uh, talk. And this will be, of course, encompassed this subject encompassed in her book. And it is so important uh, for all of us uh, in a world which increasingly ignores history to be reminded of the history of this region and the history between these two important countries that does after all one way or another go back trees with India in the subcontinent and China in its present location, give or take a few hundred miles one way or another. And um, this is just vital for us to understand. And I would say, especially in light of the recent current events in Afghanistan, because there is the great history of the so-called great game of the early of the 20th century. And the um, conflicts that have taken place in the region. There's also the question of border contact, not just with China, but also with Tajikistan, Iran, between those countries and Afghanistan, and of course, Pakistan, and of course, India, and then the rest of South Asia. And the longer term uh, strategic issues of the Indian Ocean, the Straits of Malaga, the China Sea, and so on, which makes this um, talk we've heard absolutely vital and the book beyond it for anybody who wants to get seriously 
into and understand this piece of history and its implications for today. Because there was a time, a period during the period covered by Madame Rao, um, that um, India and China seemed to have a very good solution to monitoring the border and leaving it as a matter for discussion, its exact location to be talked about by generals and not politicians and political leaders so that it was kept from being a major visible irritant until uh, really the uh, events uh, that took place at, uh, at the border in 1962. Um, uh, so, and then again, more recently uh, last year, which has brought all this back to life and also made it a very significant political issue. Um, I think that um, it's um, vital for us, I refer to us as the sort of Western world, but of course the United States of America, to understand this complex challenge as it faces us, because we are now in a period of great uncertainty, not just in the area of the 2000 mile border, because there are lots of claims made around about China having access and should control large parts of Northern India. And, um, you know, there's, there's the Ladakh area, there's the linkages with Pakistan, there's the impact on, on, um, on uh, Kashmir. And uh, so all of this is very, very current and important um, history to understand. <clears throat> so, and it represents, of course, a complete, a, a, a complex and very pressing challenge, which cannot be ignored, which is what is the long term outcome of the great change in Afghanistan, uh, which is still being digested and must be better understood and digested into the future, because it has a high relevance to all of these uh, issues that the uh, secretary has mentioned. For example, um, one has to wonder uh, about the approach of Afghanistan to the Chinese government, which has been reported. One has to wonder what China's long-term ambitions are in Afghanistan and what the linkages are going to be into the future between the Taliban and Pakistan and how those of us outside the region who have long and intimate friendships with India are going to respond to these challenges, which we are yet to fully know. So um, th th these are uh, really um, major historic events that have just been uh, unleashed in a way and are evolving before our eyes. So um, I know there'll be questions about this and I don't want to myself make comments and speculative uh, observations because I think it's too early. But for the United States, which uh, incidentally uh, has what I would call the most important geopolitical relationship in the world developing with India, and that is a view which is very present at Hoover. It's a view that's shared uh, by our director, Condoleezza Rice, former Secretary of State. And uh, it, it is no small matter. <clears throat> so we have to determine in a very complex relationship anyhow, because please remember, we are not formal allies with India. And there are sensitivities in the past and there have been sensitivity in the recent past. And we face issues going into the future with India that are that have to be adjudicated and understood, um, and um, you know made to work because we do have a large area of common interests, common features. We're both free countries. We're both democracies, 
and uh, we uh, share many, many values. And yet there are areas of um, some uh, difference between us and uh, there are sensitivities on both sides and have been over the years that need to be overcome. So I'll stop there, except for saying, Larry, that this is a first time event and thank you very much for doing this with us in the uh, US India Strengthening India Relations Program. Your program is more advanced, but we're delighted to be sharing this with you today and look forward to many future areas of working together because all these, all these issues impact both of our interests and the efforts that Hoover are making to strengthen these areas. So thanks for that very much. Well, well thank you, David. And as Secretary Rao said, we're talking about a part of the world uh, that um, is home to more, well, well over 2 billion people, which is a large slice of humanity. So it only makes sense uh, given the relationship that is the subject of Secretary Rao's book uh, and given the long and as you say, complicated history that these two programs should be interacting and cooperating uh, uh, as they will. <clears throat> Secretary Rao, I wonder if you'd want to reflect on any of the points David had made or uh, if you have anything you'd, you'd want to offer on the thorny subject of uh, of Afghanistan or the current state of U.S.-India relations? Uh, yes, yes, Larry. And thank you, Ambassador Malford, for those extremely thoughtful and very profound thoughts, I, I believe, on, on the situation in the region and the geopolitical importance uh, and cruciality of the U.S.-India relationship. But I was asked a few days to offer some thought, uh, go of, to offer some thoughts about what the situation in Afghanistan means uh, for us in the region. And I just, uh, you know, tried to unburden some of my thoughts. And uh, the first thing was that, um, you know, we all agree, would agree that the instantaneous image that comes to mind as the Taliban proclaim the capture of Afghan sovereignty is that the people of Afghanistan, uh, they are the ones I believe who have been shortchanged in all of this. And as uh, they've often been referred to, they've once more become the wretched of the earth. And um, in South Asia, here in the Indo, in the Indo Pacific, this is a region that we see as being in churn, you know, pathways to conflict and to peace crisscross. And India, particularly, because we've always been a hub country, you know, weathering wave after wave of migration, conquest, assimilation. And we're the, we've been the place of every arrival, really, in, in all senses of the word. And we have, re, we have reason to be uneasy about the emergent situation in Afghanistan. And of course, the prospect of intensified US-China rivalry post the debacle in Afghanistan. So um, if you ask any of us in the region, and I think most Indians included, uh, unbridled Chinese hegemony is not what we want, obviously. But at the same time, it can't be a binary choice, uh, you know, to, to see the other end of the spectrum as being just uh, US-China competition. Uh, we, speak, we keep speaking about multipolarity. We speak about that being healthy for the region. Uh, we speak about roles for middle powers as much as great powers. Uh, we would like an equilibrium in the region, but I understand with all that is happening in Afghanistan, uh, you know, we have we have reason to be deeply concerned about what the future holds. Again, as I mentioned in my remarks about India and China, as far as the U.S. is concerned, yes, it's a natural ally of India. There's a shared strategic convergence. And despite, you know, the withdrawal uh, of the US from Afghanistan, and uh, I think you have to recognize that there would be in the region a, a waning of trust uh, in American power and influence in the region, you have to deal with that. 
But the appeal of the US as a democracy, as a champion of fundamental freedoms, plural societies, its economic and military heft is still very important for India and especially the numerous blood relationships that link our nations together. And that impacts Indian public opinion constantly when we, when we talk about the US. But Let's look at groupings like the Quad, and you know you're going to have an in-person uh, meeting of the Quad when when the prime ministers uh, of the region uh, of the member countries visit President Biden in the White House uh, in a few days from now, Prime Minister Modi included, and um, so even as we focus on a maritime environment that enables smooth connectivities and supply chains and humanitarian assistance and respect for international law, let's also not turn our you know, heads away from Afghanistan. And let's think about, let's think of even the Quad trying to salvage to the maximum extent possible an inclusive development dividend for Afghanistan that especially empowers women, that promotes minority rights. And if this means that we need new cooperative grids call them grids, where we work with China, where we even, you know, have to, uh, you know, connect with Iran and Russia, let's circle the wagons against terrorist forces, because that is the biggest threat I think the region faces today uh, with the return of the Taliban and ensuring that Pakistan, which is believed to mastermind this dark side and is reviled by ordinary Afghans as a result, uh, learns to work for Afghan betterment rather than Afghanistan's continued ruin, because Pakistan has virtually been a keeper, I believe, of this graveyard of empires. And uh, how do we operationalize some kind of grids of cooperation to really restrict and, uh, in a sense, uh, constrain Pakistan uh, from doing what it has always uh, had the propensity to do in Afghanistan? Well, let me say, Madam Secretary, uh, that there are some glimmers of, uh, I think, extremely interesting and creative strategic thought in what you just said about how to move forward uh, in Afghanistan in a situation that we can no longer control, we the United States, but might still be able to influence and all the more so in partnership with India uh, and other partners, uh, such as our Quad partners, you have some very interesting ideas there. Uh, I would submit that um, if there's true confrontation uh, with China that um, requires the US and India to think about how they may align uh, or cooperate or partner, I'm not gonna use the word ally, Mm -hmm. um, in the face of it, it's not going to be in Afghanistan. It's going to be in the South China Sea uh, and, um, yes, potentially on your border uh, and in, 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 in China's general expansionism within the Indo-Pacific and quite possibly in the thing that frankly most worries me, uh, which is uh, some kind of uh, effort to military, militarily resolve uh, the Taiwan question. Yes. So uh, I'd like to ask you, um, as the Quad develops uh, and understanding if it is correct to understand that India views the Quad um, as a, a hopeful and flexible vehicle for closer cooperation, but not as a pathway leading to you know, a formal alliance. Uh, how far can this go? And you know, what are the outer limits of the ways that India uh, and the United States can cooperate to meet the challenge of not only wolf warrior um, Chinese diplomacy, but wolf warrior coercion uh, increasingly played under Chinese leader Xi Jinping who is a lot more, I think, like Mao Zedong than uh, both internally and externally uh, than his predecessors were. Yes, um, well, I think we're dealing with a very different China today from the China of Hu Jintao. Uh, the China of Xi Jinping, uh, you know, is essentially uh, 
in many ways uh, an an imperium, uh, you know, a, a, a domain that that seeks to not only influence uh, the rest of the world, uh, rest of the region at least, but also to uh, to uh, to uh, to practice, I would say, a very extractive diplomacy uh, when it comes to its interactions uh, with uh, with countries in the region. Um, I think uh, nations in the Quad uh, and India, the United States, Japan, and Australia uh, have to understand that the region and the situation that they confront today is extremely fluid. It, this is a nation in churn, and uh, the Quad is a, is 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 a is a is a body. It's a, you know it's a set of dialogue partners that are still in many ways, I think charting uh, their way forward in the, uh, when, as they're being confronted with an extremely assertive and extremely hyperactive China in the region. And now the withdrawal of the US from Afghanistan has also, I'm sure, impacted uh, the, the outlook of many, uh, no, I'm not talking of the Quad members, but other countries in the region. As far as China is concerned, I think the Chinese have been, uh, have in a sense been gloating about the, about the impact of that withdrawal and what it seems to convey, what messages it seems to convey. Uh, but, you know, I think they, they may be uh, gloating too soon because we all know that even in Afghanistan, as China seeks to uh, spread its uh, influence and assert its presence, uh, the situation is so fluid and so uncertain. Uh, and uh, if you are to go by the experience of other countries that have dealt with Afghanistan in the past, the U.S. included, uh, the outcomes are very, very uncertain, even for China. I think countries like the Quad, um, at least as far as India is concerned, I think we would take a lot of, uh, 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 we draw a lot of uh, uh, in uh, lessons and also uh, pathways from uh, the manner in which countries like Japan deal with China in the region. Because as I mentioned at the outset, I don't think conflict, open conflict between India, between China and the United States can really be good. Nobody would agree that or concede that they would be good for the region. And even the potential of a US-China conflict over Taiwan is going to, uh, you know, is greeted with a sense of great foreboding and uh, what the what is going to be the impact of that if it were to happen. So I think the nation and even countries like the Quad have to give a lot of attention uh, in the discussing of these possible scenarios and in working out what the strategies of response should be, what the role of each country should be. Take a country like India, you know, we have this long coastline. We have been, in a sense, endowed by nature, by our creator, with, with this wonderfully long coastline that sits at the top of the Indian Ocean. And how are we to, uh, to gain strategic advantage from this? Uh, not, not that, you know, this long and exposed co coastline should intensify our vulnerability to countries like China? How is it that we are going to be able to build those defenses, that strate those strategic responses uh, to a China that is increasingly active, that is using much of its presence in the region, re places like Hambantota and Gwadar, into possible strategic pivots that, um, that could transform themselves from just, you know, places at the moment into, into bases and into, into um, uh, positions of military advantage. And I think that should be a focus also, uh, you know, uh, do we, how do we build our logistical advantages in the region? How do we work with like-minded countries in the Quad uh, to be able to contribute to a, a collective um, uh, architecture, a strategic architecture that, that is based on, on the rule of law and on the settlement of disputes in a rationalized and in a negotiated manner, 
but at the same time prepare prepare for for the worst case scenarios also yes thank you for that um i would point out um something that I think is very, very important when the question comes up, what should the United States be doing with India? Because what we should do is remember what really has happened between the United States and India, which is that over many years, the relationship between us has been more between our civil societies often and our private sectors and people to people than it has been in diplomatic um, initiatives of one kind or another. And this has bound the American people and the Indian public closely together. And these values that are uh, created in this way are very strong. And you have to add now the more recent uh, set of relationships which are heavily economic. Mm -hmm. India is developing a much more modern, uh, much more uh, active economy that's put us put India at the top of the league table of, uh, of uh, emerging countries for a long period of time, just in the past 14, 15, uh, 16 years. And these relationships are very important in democracies and free countries because they impact and provide the impulse for governmental actions, um, as is mentioned earlier, the parliaments, the congresses, and so on. And I would say this aspect of US India relations is very strong um, when you consider. You know, the vast number of Indian students in America, the countless areas of cooperation in science and technology and business and direct investment and trade and so on. We can do better and we ought to try very hard to do that. But we have done well when you consider that in 1998, we placed sanctions on India for a nuclear test that set our relation back seven or eight years into that period, into the early uh, part of the uh, 21st century. So I think there's a lot to be optimistic about there. Um, and uh, this, of course, places a heavy burden on the United States to, to do the right things, of course. Um, and among those things, I think is a very important lesson that we should keep in mind from our recent experiences and that is when we talk about diplomatic links in an effort to keep uh, India, Japan, and other countries close, is that there is a very big difference between what I would call frontline states and states further back. And the frontline states on the, this 2000 mile border are India, and it doesn't stop there because the other frontline state is Taiwan. And frontline states have a very different, often a very different view of their interests than those who surround them and are advising what they should do. So we need to keep that lesson in mind. And, and because there is very little evidence of contact between India and Taiwan, at least in recent years. And so one wonders, you know, whether this couldn't be stronger, uh, Madam Secretary, and um, or is it too much of a risk to get that to be stronger, because right. it implies there's some alliance being formed. So could I just put that question on observation to you? I think, Ambassador, that's a very important point that you have raised. The relationship between India and Taiwan. Uh, well, I would go back uh, to the early or the mid 1990s when you know we opened up our trade offices uh, in each other's um, uh, territories 
uh, our office in Taiwan and their, their offices uh, office in, in India. So the trade and economic uh, relations between India and Taiwan have in a sense uh, developed over the last uh, two, two and a half decades. And I think that that has been a direction uh, that has uh, progressed and, uh, and has in a sense been uh, blessed by both sides. And um, there's really nothing that the PRC can, can do about it. But and transcultural ties and educational ties between India and Taiwan have also been fostered, uh, particularly in the last decade. So uh, the direction is certainly forward looking as uh, far as those links go. And uh, I think in the context of what has happened in India-China relations post Galwan, post June 2020, I think the urge and the inclination and the, the orientation towards strengthening these ties is very much there. Uh, without in 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 uh, in these uh, ties, without these ties being in any way a deviation uh, from what you would call the one China policy that uh, the government of India has has followed uh, from inception, from the time of the establishment of the People's Republic. So the one China policy remains in place, but that has not deterred India from. Uh, from making progress on its trade, economic and cultural and people to people ties. You mentioned the context of people to people ties and also more connectivity between India and Taiwan in terms of air flights and, and uh, also uh, you know, shipping and other infrastructural contacts. Great, uh, Secretary Rao, I'm now gonna turn it over to my colleagues starting with uh, Glenn Tifford. Uh, but since this will be, uh, my last sentence, I want to thank not only you for your eloquent remarks, I want to thank India for the home it has given to the Dalai Lama and to a, a good section of the Tibetan cultural and religious uh, life uh, having uh, been forced into exile. I think this is a very noble thing that India has done, and uh, as you've already implied, it did it at some risk, and I think the world owes India a debt for that. Over to you, Glenn. Thank you very much, Larry, and thank you, David, and thank you in particular, Secretary Rao, for extremely thoughtful remarks and hopeful ones as well. We now enter the audience question and answer section of our program, and I encourage you, if you have questions, to submit them using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Uh, Dinsha Mystery and I will take them in, in alternating succession. I'd like to start by posing one that, um, that I've drawn out of the list that have been submitted, and that concerns the Belt and Road. Um, Secretary Rao, I wonder if you could comment on how India understands the Belt and Road Initiative that China has launched around the world. It is active in a great many places in which India is also active, particularly Africa, Southeast Asia, and Central Asia. Could you shed light on India's understanding of this initiative and how it chooses to compete? Um, yes, yes, I will. And before I answer that question, I just wanted to also add one more point to the uh, th the issue of Taiwan, which Ambassador Mal Malford had raised with me. I uh, would also like to mention that the question of technology ties with between India and Taiwan is also very important, apart from the trade and economic ties. Turning to the Belt and Road Initiative of, of the Chinese, uh, uh, I think uh, we're all, uh, we have, uh, especially democracies such as ours, have expressed concern about, uh, you know, the whole, uh, the whole structural aspects of the way the BRI programs have been conducted across the world. And we all understand, we all understand the need for better infrastructure, we all understand the need for greater development, we all understand the needs of smaller nations in the world. Uh, to be able to receive the finance and the wherewithal to improve their infrastructural situation. I mean, nobody has any quarrel with that, but I think it's just the way that uh, debts have been built up and um, many smaller nations have been drawn into a greater web of, um, of uh, in many ways, 
uh, a situation which has left them with very little options as far as the future is concerned in terms of repayment of the finances that the Chinese have given them. And what happens when repayment is not possible is that new terms and conditions are introduced, which have uh, essentially resulted in, uh, you've seen the case of Hambantota in Sri Lanka, for instance, where a 99-year-old lease was signed, which essentially turned over the harbor and the surrounding hinterland areas uh, for Chinese development and Chinese use. And, and this is in a region that overlooks, um, you know, a very important sea line of communication between um, between East Asia, Southeast Asia, the Indian Ocean, and uh, the coast of Africa and, and beyond. Uh, so these are issues of concern. I think they also point uh, to the fact that there was a vacuum created because many of us were not able to essentially build ties of closer integration within the region, better connectivity. And the Chinese have made use of that vacuum, have made use of a certain felt need for better infrastructure and, uh, and come in and fill that, that vacuum. The other uh, aspect of concern that we have about the BRI in our region is that uh, the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, which is essentially the flagship project of the BRI, uh, runs through territory which India sees as, um, you know, it's essentially a territory which is disputed between India and Pakistan. India sees it as territory occupied by Pakistan, and it's that territory which is currently under Pakistani occup occupation in the state of Kashmir that uh, through which uh, the China-Pakistan economic corridor runs from Xinjiang into, into Pakistan. So, there are questions of sovereignty involved, and in such a situation, it's very difficult for India to essentially dialogue or interact or discuss with China questions relating to the BRI. So in many senses, there are, you know, there's a great wall that has been built around the BRI uh, as a result of this, and it has a lot to do, I think, with with this new imperium of Xi Jinping and the manner in which the BRI was launched. I think it was a Chinese project, a Chinese driven project, and there was very little that the other region, the rest of the region had to do with developing uh, the contours of this project and the directions that it should take. So, so that in many ways also speaks volumes about the way the Chinese approach diplomacy in the region and the kind of, uh, you know, everything being driven out of Beijing and uh, with very, little options being available. Although if you talk to some of the recipient countries, they will they will swear that the BRI benefits them and that, you know, all this talk about uh, mounting debt and liabilities is really doesn't square with the reality. But I think there are serious uh, problems and issues that need to be discussed. But maybe, you know, in a few years from now, all this will become much more clear. But right now, you know, the BRI, uh, the way it's been transacted, the way it's been developed, I think there are causes for concern. And, um, and I think what we are doing uh, with the US and Japan and uh, what we're trying to do in the Quad, uh, trying to develop resilient supply chains, trying to provide, you know, more transparent methods of development finance uh, and uh, and um, development projects for the region. I think that's the direction we need to take, stronger technology ties. Um, and uh, in, in, any, in a sense, being much more nimble and much more deft in terms of the manner in which we develop uh, options and answers uh, to this new uh, Chinese activism. Thank you very much, Dinsha. I think we have Thank room you. for one more short question. I'll try and make it short. Uh, again, from the Q and A, uh, it's very helpful to think about India-China China relations broadly. Uh, I'd like to hear a little bit more about the border itself. Do you think that the India-China border 
has any scope for improving in the next, say, 20 years, or is it going to be a constant hot border that we're going to be seeing coming out of India, China? Uh, well, I think in sure that it certainly does uh, neither country good for us to continue and uh, to live with this kind of protracted tension and standoff and confrontation uh, in the in the border areas because uh, one of the main offshoots or the main byproducts of such confrontation is bloodshed is is uh, is conflict and uh, a, a further deterioration in the climate of relations which can't which is not good for for peace and security in the region so i think the the um, the priority for india and china is to seek uh, regimes of de-escalation of uh, of uh, uh, diffusing tensions along the border uh, the confidence building mechanisms and the um, measures that were put in place over the last 25, 30 years to reduce tensions along the border somehow didn't work as far as, uh, you know, what you saw in Galwan last year uh, was concerned. So there is obvious need for us to rethink that process of confidence building. And um, and we were not we have never been able either side to sit down and come to a joint understanding of where the line of actual control between the two countries lies, you know, particularly in the Western sector of the border. How are we going to address that uh, situation? Maybe the new regime of confidence building uh, should include at least the identification of those areas where tensions have occurred and to see how uh, uh, methods of uh, diffusing tension and uh, redeployment of forces and uh, uh, and you know in order uh, ensuring uh, an area where conflict uh, is less likely to occur as a result of such disengagement i think that is a priority i don't believe a solution a settlement of the border is round the corner i think uh, sit, the attitudes have hardened over the years. And as I said, uh, you know, with the kind of uh, uh, hyper-nationalism that you're seeing, particularly coming out of China today, and a certain rigidity of approach when it comes to border problems and territorial claims, you know, the border question has now become a territorial question between the two countries. There are huge swaths of territory that are claimed from either side. And, and unless there is political will and vision and, and, and the recognition of the fact that you need to come to some degree of compromise and accommodation and adjustment of each other's claims, there's not going to be a solution. So that's where it is. Sounds like a constant need for diplomacy. Uh, let's pass it to David for some closing remarks. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, first of all, thank you, uh, Secretary Rao, for a most interesting and informative uh, period here. Um, I would like to make one observation about Belt and Road and ask if you could perhaps pursue that in your surveys of history. And that is when you think of China's interest at the moment in Afghanistan, it's hard to separate that from probably a great, a great interest they have in the minerality and other opportunities, uh, natural resource opportunities in Afghanistan. When you look at Belt and Road, which India had the good sense to try to take part in, as it appeared in the investment bank that was formed by China, where India took the second most senior position, um, and you look back in history, we ought to take some lessons from the end of colonialism because uh, when you look at colonialism, what happened basically over the years was that the colonial powers found that the people they were had colonized were less and less comfortable with the idea that foreigners controlled all their natural resources. And they began to wonder about why are all these fellows from somewhere else in charge of everything and, and mining our resources and so on and so forth. And that helped build up the opposition against colonialism that eventually the colonial powers had to compromise with and then concede to. 
And this is a very important historical process. So when you made your point about, you know, don't think too far ahead because the future is unknown, but you could maybe think about the end of colonialism as in a way the Achilles heel of this other imperium that you referred to. But um, I would like to uh, once again, thank you and say that we look forward to having you regularly participate with us here at Hoover, uh, 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 because you have such extraordinary breadth of views and depth of historical knowledge. And um, Larry, I'd like to thank you uh, for your uh, grace today and inviting us and um, point out that uh, I hope in the India program, we will have a good sense to include you every single time in anything we do. So um, I think that ends it from my standpoint. I don't know, Larry, do you have a comment? No, only deep gratitude to this remarkable woman, Secretary Rao and her distinguished career. I'd wanted to manage to, to uh, note in the introduction. So I will note in the closing that in addition to all of her other extraordinary professional and intellectual accomplishments, she's also a published poet. And I think you can see the literary gifts that contributed to that uh, in the eloquence of her remarks. So thank you very much. Thank you, thank you so much. And I uh, thank you, David. Thank you, Glenn and Dincha. And uh, our event is now closed. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you, thank you, Ambassador. Thank you, Larry. Thank you, Dincha.